And today we're continuing to talk about the life of Daniel as we continue to talk about the Among the Lions series. And the shootings actually prompts a reminder that we live in a very dark time, a very hard culture. In fact, there's been seasons of my life as I've navigated 37 years and I've looked at this world. Somebody laughed when I said that. I, yes, I'm 37. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. And I've, I've often wondered in my life, was I born in the wrong era? That it would have been great to have been born in a season where I was raised, where, you know, where I was alive. I was born in the 80s, but, but to have been ministering in the 80s and the 90s or the 70s or even the 30s and 40s where there were these great moves of God where there was these revivals and outpouring of God's spirit, and it seems today where that's becoming less and less. They're there, but it's, it's discouraging, and there's been times in my life where I've wondered, God, why am I alive? Because this world is so dark, and nobody seems to want to hear the message of Jesus Christ. If I post something on Facebook, I'm going to get blasted. If I say something on the news, I'm going to get blasted by both Christians and non-Christians. It's the world we live in. And there's been times where I've felt like a man at a time, and I felt like I, I don't belong. But this is not the first time that culture's been godless, and it's been dark. And we've been learning in the book of Daniel that in the, in the, in the land of Babylon, it was dark. It was a pagan culture. There's been several times. And God is always going to raise up men and women of faith that will stand the test of time and preach the truth of the word of God. And so the Holy Spirit's been convicting me and to thinking, you know what? I'm not gonna wonder whether I should be born. I'm gonna wake up and say, it's a good day to be alive. I am born for a purpose. You are born for a purpose. And we are to spread the news of Jesus Christ. Amen? Look at your neighbor and say, it's a great time to be alive. Amen. It truly is. We have an opportunity, church, to see biblical things come to pass. We live in a time where the, see, the, the field is ripe with a harvest of miracles, signs and wonders. We just got to go out there and take it. And that's what the life of Daniel, his whole life was about that. And so we've talked, Pastor Brian and Pastor Nate, they've done an amazing job of setting up the life of Daniel over the past few weeks. And we've, we've walked through multiple tests. Daniel was somewhere around the ages of 15 and 17 when he was taken under King Nebuchadnezzar. And he was a man of God then. And then he passed tests in his, his 20s and 30s and his 40s and 50s. And now he is in his 80s in Daniel chapter 6. And that's where we're going to be today as we talk about Daniel and the lion's den. And this is the third king that Daniel's been under. He was under Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar. And Belshazzar was assassinated by King Darius, who was from the Medes and Persians. And now he is under King Darius. But the, but the theme that Daniel kept going through was no matter how much he stood for God, no matter how much he was faithful and responsible and never wavered in his beliefs, he kept getting promoted. And he kept being successful. And that's so counter to what we think sometimes. We think that if I, if I stand for what I believe in my workplace, if I stand in my family, or if I stand out in the public and I promote what I truly believe in this day and age, man, I, I have no talent. I'm, I'm not going to work. I'm going to get fired. I'm going to go through this. But Daniel is proof that that's actually not true, that if you stand for God, God will do something amazing. He'll stand for you. So why did Daniel always keep getting promoted? So I have a a couple of things that I have here for you. These are not in our notes this morning, and so if you want to write these down separate, they're going to be on the screen. But there's three quick things that why did Daniel keep getting promoted at work? And number one, his professional competence made him stand out. Daniel chapter 6, verse 3 says, Daniel soon proved himself more capable than all the other administrators and high officers because of Daniel's great ability. And the king made plans to place him over the entire empire. This guy, no matter what he does, keeps getting promoted. But he was a hard worker. He was responsible. He did what was asked him. He was not lazy. He was faithful. And he was a hard worker. Number two, his personal character made him stand out. 
Daniel was a really good guy. Daniel was a man of integrity. He was the guy that you write home to mom about. He was just a good guy. In fact, Daniel chapter 6 verse 4 says, Then the other administrators and high officers began searching for some fault in the way Daniel was handling government affairs. But they couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn. He was faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. Now, i got to be honest with you. You know, I feel like I've lived a pretty clean life, but I, I, I wouldn't want anybody to just look inside the closets. Amen? I don't know if anybody's willing to just say, hey, I'm an open book. But Daniel was truly a man of God, a man of integrity, a man of character. And that's something that made him truly stand out. And then number three, and this is really where we're going with our message today, is his public commitment to God made him stand out. And that's the secret. That's the secret to Daniel's life. His entire life was wrapped up in no matter what he faced, he always stood by what he believed. He stood by God no matter what, no matter what threats were on his life, no matter how many times he could have completely failed or his life was taken from him, he truly never wavered. His commitment to God made him stand out. And so today, I want to talk about in our culture, in our world, how can we stand strong for God publicly and and remove fear, remove doubt? Because there's fear. We We all know that we live in a world that Christianity is definitely under attack. And it's hard. It's hard to talk about it. It's hard to discuss it. It's hard to write it on social media and not have somebody blast us for what we believe in and say that it's an old religion or it's time for a change. Or that, you know, the Bible was written thousands of years ago and it needs, to, it needs a change. It needs a fresh coat of paint. And it's hard to stand for these things. But Daniel's proof that if you hold to God, he will hold to you. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the book of Daniel. God, I thank you that when Daniel was alive, he didn't have the book of Daniel. But all he had was prayer. And he trusted on you. But God, but because he was faithful, now we have even more resources. We have the word of God with us to be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And I pray that today that we hear your word and it does not return void, but it goes out in power and it makes us alive. And your word says to anyone who has ears, let them hear. I pray that we would hear today your word. I pray you would anoint me to preach. It's not about me. I pray that the Holy Spirit would speak through me and that lives would be changed. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So here's, here's, the, here's the scene. So King Darius from the Medes and Persians has come and taken over Babylon. And he has set up three governors over the empire. And one of those governors was Daniel. He keeps getting promoted. We read earlier that he was actually getting ready to promote him as the number one ruler over the entire empire. But Darius also set up 120 leaders over different provinces. These were administrators. They were called satraps. And these administrators, these satraps, they didn't like Daniel. Jealousy, maybe. Maybe they didn't like what he stood for. Maybe, maybe there was some racism. I, I tend to think that they, they were catching wind that he was going to become, he was going to become the boss, the, the, you know, the kind of the leader of the empire, and they were a very pagan culture, and, and with Daniel coming in with all these godly ideas, that they didn't want to have that. They couldn't, they couldn't go to parties. They couldn't sleep around. They couldn't do this. They couldn't do that. And if he comes, he's going to bring a very God-centered culture, and we don't want that. And so they wanted to get rid of him. But we read earlier that they couldn't find anything wrong with him. You know, the presidential candidates, they always release all this stuff on the news. And they did this 20 years ago, or they said this on Twitter five years ago, and all this stuff like that. They couldn't find anything. Daniel was a man of integrity. So it says in Daniel chapter 6, verse 5, and I'm going to put this up on the screen. But it says, they concluded that our only chance of finding grounds for accusing Daniel will be in connection with the rules of his religion. So they're going to trap him in his own belief. And so these satraps, they get together 
to set a trap for Daniel. Here's what they do. We're going to put up on the screen Daniel chapter 6, verse 6 through 9. And it says, so the administrators and high officers went to the king and said, long live King Darius. We are all in agreement, we administrators, officials, high officers, advisors, and governors. Now I want to stop right there. They have set a trap within a trap. Because they're going to the king and they're saying, we're all in agreement. We've all talked about this. Now Darius loved Daniel and he valued Daniel and he respected Daniel. So by them saying we're all in agreement, all the governors, all the administrators, all the leaders, they're tricking King Darius into thinking, hey, we've talked this over with Daniel and he's good. Oh, if Daniel thinks this is good, this is great. I'm into this. So they've tricked him. And they're appeasing to his ego. And so they say, Give orders that the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone divine or human except for you, your majesty, will be thrown into the den of lions. And now, your majesty, issue and sign this law so it cannot be changed, an official law of the Medes and Persians that cannot be revoked. So King Darius signed the law. So they come to Darius and they appeal to his ego. King, we've got this great idea. For the next 30 days, it's all about you. We're going to worship you. That sounds great. Kind of sounds like one of my birthday months. <laughs> For the next 30 days, it's all about me. I got three little kids. <laughs> Not about me. But that's a beautiful idea. It sounds great. Everybody's going to cheer you on. Everybody's going to worship you. They're going to sing songs to you for the next 30 days. And your favorite guy, he thinks it's a great idea too. And so they trick him. And the Medes and the Persians had a rule that if you made a law, it could not be revoked or repealed. So even the king, when he realized what he had done, couldn't change the law. They had Daniel. They had him. They trapped him. And so what did Daniel do when he heard this law? Here's a few options that Daniel could have done. Daniel could have fake prayed to the king, pretend. He could have protested. He could have marched around the kingdom and with his signs, I will not pray to you and I will not do this and do that. But we know that this was not a democracy. You can't change laws. We just read that, the Medes and the Persians. Once a law is set, you can't change it. That wouldn't do any good. He could appeal to the king privately. King, listen, let, put me in hiding somewhere or, or something or, 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 you know, something. What, what can we do? This is a really good one. He could have kept praying, but prayed in secret. And I think the truth is, if we're being honest, a lot of us, that's probably what we would do. Just kind of keep our heads down under the radar. We'll pray in silence. But you see, had Daniel done that, the enemy would have won. Because the enemy wanted Daniel to back down. They wanted to silence him. They wanted to take away his religious rights and his religious freedoms. Sound familiar? They wanted to take something from him. And had Daniel had gone into another room or, or had prayed in secret, the enemy would have scoffed and said, we got him. There's a victory. We're pushing it back. But Daniel, he's the type of man that's going to say, no, I'm going to stand firm and I'm going to push the darkness back. That's what we're called to be, church. And there's seasons in your life where you feel like maybe somebody has trapped you or there's people that are jealous of you in, 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 in your workplace, in your home, in your life, in your friendships. And you feel like there's people, maybe your boss is attacking you and attacking what you believe in and maybe he's affecting your work schedule. Or maybe somebody's after your job or they're after your office. But I'm telling you, don't pray in secret. Don't hide. Don't back down. Stand strong. An option that Daniel could have done is he could have kept praying like he always did for his whole life. And that's exactly what Daniel did. 
Daniel chapter 6, verse 10 and 11. We're going to read this together. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with its windows open towards Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day just as he had always done, giving thanks to God. And then the officials went together to Daniel's house and found him praying and asking for God's help. He lived his life as usual. What I love about this is he didn't have to come out and make some big statement. He didn't throw his windows open and say, hey, everybody, look, I'm praying. Come and get me. No, he did that every day. Every day, three times a day, he would open his windows towards Jerusalem and he would give praise and thanks to God. And what a convicting thought that that filled my life was that if Christianity was outlawed tomorrow, would my usual everyday routine in life, would I be found guilty? Not that I want to be thrown in a lion's den, don't get me wrong. (laughs) But, If I'm walking out in the public, does somebody say, that man has been with Jesus? Does somebody say, that man prays and seeks God and reads his word? Is my usual life something that stands for Christ in some shape or fashion? Because Daniel's life did. And they got him, they found him right where they thought they would, and they had him. But it takes amazing courage to be able to open those windows knowing I'm going to be thrown in a lion's den. So why was Daniel unafraid to stand out and speak up for God at work? Here's three things. Let's write these down. Number one, he remembered that God had been faithful in past tests. We talked about how when the king went to Daniel and he said, you must eat the meat and the foods that have been offered to pagan gods. And Daniel says, not going to do it. In fact, Daniel chapter 1 verse 3 says, I will not defile my body. I will obey the Lord. And he doesn't defile his body. And they tell him, you're going to grow weak and the king's going to have no use for you and you're going to die. And he says, give me 10 days. And so they give him 10 days, and he eats nothing but vegetables and water. And when they go and check him, he is stronger and healthier than any of the other people. God was faithful because he stood strong. And when you get frightened in life, when you go through things, if you remember those past tests, it will, it will encourage you and strengthen you and help you walk through that. I, I know for me there was, a, <laughs> there was a season where I was a little bit of a careless driver until um, I moved to Iowa. Now I'm an enraged driver. <laughs> um, but I was driving one evening. I was trying to go to a late movie, just got done um, doing a writing session in, in Franklin, Tennessee. And it was raining cats and dogs. It was horrible. And I, for some reason, thought, I can handle this. I'm a good driver. I'm solid. A little bit of rain's not going to stop me. So I, driving on the interstate, everybody who's wise is driving way below the speed limit, being careful. And I'm driving 70, 75, just trying to get to my destination. I had a 40-minute drive. And I'm just trying to get there on time. And sure enough, I'm in the far left lane. There's a concrete wall next to me. And I'm in the far left lane, and I hit a patch of water, and my car starts to hydroplane. And my car starts to turn to the right. And then I look to the right at me, and there's an 18-wheeler coming right at me. And I'm like, well, that's not good. So I turn to the left, and my car starts kind of swerving like this. And finally, it just starts kind of moving, merging into this concrete wall. And I'm thinking to myself, this is it. My life is flashing before my eyes. I wish I could call my wife. I wish I could hug my daughter. My life's over. I, there's, there's no way I'm going to hit a concrete wall going 70 miles an hour and come out of this, you know, unscathed. be a miracle if I stay alive. And so, but then I hit the wall and my car instantly stops. And I'm like, I'm alive. I may have had to change my bridges, but 
<laughs> but other than that, I was good. I get out of my car, and the only damage to my car was a bent rim on my tire. What had happened is when I turned the wheel to the left, the, the tire got out just enough that when I hit the wall, the only thing that hit the wall was the rubber on the tire. And the impact, for some reason, made the car stop instantly and didn't push me back out into the road into oncoming traffic. Absolute miracle that I'm here alive today. And I walk through that to tell you this is that when I go through hard times, now that was my own stupidity. <laughs> At least Daniel wasn't dumb. I was dumb. But, but God is faithful. He loves us. And when I, when I go through seasons of my life where there's fear, I can remember that time where God delivered me. And there's seasons in your life where God has delivered you. And if you remember the past tests, God will be faithful to you. And that's how Daniel was able to face a lion's den. Number two, he had a conversation with God three times a day. It said in that verse that he, talked, he prayed three times a day. You imagine that if you talk to God since you were a child to 80, maybe 82 years old, you talk to God three times a day every day, you think you might be a little bit confident? A little bit of peace would come over you? You're talking to the creator, the source of peace, the source of life, the source of hope. You know, church, the key to standing strong is kneeling often. That no matter what you walk through in this life, if you get on your knees and pray. You're struggling at work, get on your knees. You're struggling in your marriage, get on your knees. You're struggling with your kids, get on your knees. If you're hoping that Iowa wins a football game, get on your knees. <laughs> I shouldn't talk. Alabama lost the championship, and I'm still upset about it. I didn't get on my knees, so uh, I digress. But we have to pray and talk to God. The veil that was separating God and man has been torn, and now we can come boldly into the throne room of God, and we can actually go further and deeper than Daniel could. There's really no excuse, church, to what we have access to. The same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives inside of you. And we can stand stronger than any people in the Old Testament. Because the spirit of God is inside of us. We just got to stand. Amen? And then number three, he knew that the rewards were greater than the risks. Was there a risk? Absolutely. Was it dangerous? Yes. Did he get thrown into the lion's den? Absolutely. And there's going to be times where you're thrown into your own pit of lions. Or you're going to have enemies and you could name your lions. You're going to have your seasons. Or maybe you've never been thrown into a lion's den because you've never truly stood for God. And God is just waiting for you to stand so that he can do a miracle in your life and change the world around you. Whatever your circumstance today, the rewards are greater than the risks. They're greater. What do we have to lose, truly, versus what do we have to gain? And Daniel knew that. And so, very quickly, I wrote down six ways that we can benefit every time we stand for God. And number one, write this down. Standing for God is a victory over fear. Well, I'm going to say that again and maybe get a little bit better response. Um, <laughs> standing for God is a victory over fear. There we go. Everybody has some kind of fear or an anxiety or secret fear. We're lying if we, if we say otherwise. Now, for me, I have to be completely honest, and I can't believe I'm going to share this. But I have a secret fear, and it's silly, it's silly, but it's the truth. I am terrified of the ocean, more, actually really more of what's in the ocean. <laughs> I watched the movie Jaws when I was a kid, 
because my parents were great parents. And uh, I watched that movie, and I am convinced that if I put my toe in the ocean, that there's going to be jaws just coming right up. Even to the point where if I get in a swimming pool in the deep end, and if I think about, hey, I wonder if like, there's a shark under there, I get like anxiety comes up as if a shark's going to shimmy up and get me. It's, it's ridiculous. I know. I was just at the beach with my wife, and my wife's like, you going to get in the water? Nope. <laughs> you go enjoy being somebody's lunch. Because I'm not going to do it. And the entire time, we're sitting there, and she's like, you keep looking for a shark attack, aren't you? I'm like, absolutely. I am. And uh, I, I do. So anyway, so I bought this VR headset. And I, I get home with it, and, you know, it, it puts you in a full 360 environment, and you, you feel like you're there. It's, it's really, really crazy. And so I'm, I'm on the YouTube videos and, and the 360, and so I see this thing get inside of a shark cage. I'm like, oh, that's a really bad idea. <laughs> but of course I'm going to do it. And so I get inside of this shark cage, and the moment I turn it on, I'm like, this, I, this fear comes over me. It's, it's not real, but it feels real. And I'm getting ready to turn the button off, and I turn to the left, and there's this shark coming by me. And I'm pretty sure I had to yet again change my pants. And... <laughs> It was terrifying. It didn't make it any better that my six-year-old daughter puts it on. She's like, this is awesome. You're a wimp, Dad. <laughs> <sighs> but even though it, it seems so real, it's not real. You see, fear is false evidence appearing real. F-E-A-R. It's just an emotion. And we all know that emotions can lie to us. It's not real. But if we buy into it, it cripples us. I mean, I, I'm, being, I'm being honest when I say I truly am afraid to swim in the ocean, and, and if I don't overcome that, I'm going to miss out on some great opportunities on vacations with my wife and kids over something that's probably never going to happen. But I let that fear paralyze me. And when you're at work and you have a moment where the Holy Spirit prompts your heart and says, I want you to tell that person that God loves them or tell them a, a word that God has for them or to pray. You see them, you notice they're sick and God says, pray for their healing. And you're like, I am not going to do that. And that fear paralyzes you. It keeps you from being who God's created you to be. Jesus says in John 14, greater things you'll do in my name. For he has not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. And fear cripples us. But when we stand for God, it's a victory over fear. Number two, standing for God builds faith and character. I promise I wasn't going to do this, but, but I've got to. Faith, is, faith and character are like building muscles. And the more you stand for God, the more you build your faith, the more you build your character. And it's just like going to the gym. You go to the gym and you work. It doesn't happen overnight. You work hard, you work hard. The more you stand for God, the more it builds your faith, the more it builds your character. And I promise you, after a long period of time, your faith and character will look like these bad boys. Oh, man, God have mercy on my soul. <laughs> Pastor Brian's probably watching this going, yeah, he's not preaching anymore. <laughs> but I'm... <laughs> I don't laugh too hard. That hurts a little bit. <laughs> but I'm, I'm telling you that the more you stand for God, the easier it's going to get. You're going to grow stronger. Your faith's going to grow stronger. It's going to build your character. Number three, and I love this one. I should probably put this back on. It makes me feel more pastoral. <laughs> but number three, it gives God to do, it gives God an opportunity to do a miracle. When you stand for God, listen, if you go to a funeral and you walk up to a casket and you pray that the dead be raised again, it gives God an opportunity to do a miracle. Now, he chooses whether or not it happens, and we don't understand why it's yes sometimes or why it's no sometimes, but when you walk in faith, it opens a door for God to do a miracle. When you pray for your family to be healed, it gives God an open door for a miracle. 
When you stand in faith, it gives God an opportunity to do a miracle. And Daniel standing in faith, getting arrested and throwing in a lion's den, it gave God an amazing opportunity to send an angel and shut the mouth of the lions and change an entire nation because he stood for faith. So I'm telling you, church, when you stand for God, you give him an open door for a miracle. And where are the areas in our life where we're not standing and God's not doing miracles in us? Make sure you stand for him. Number four, it encourages other believers to stand up. Philippians 1.14 says, because, and this is Paul, because of what I've been through, many of the Christians have, been, have gained confidence and become more bold in telling others about Christ. You, you may go to work and you may feel like you're standing al- alone. But when you stand for God, it'll be amazing how you start it alone, but eventually you'll recognize that there's an army standing with you. Because sometimes people are just waiting for someone to be the catalyst that will move things forward. Why can't it be you? And when you stand in faith, it encourages all the believers around you. That's why sometimes when somebody comes to an altar and you were kind of wrestling with it, but that person stepped out in faith, you're like, well, I'm gonna go too. Because you saw somebody else take a step And when you stand for God, it encourages people and it helps people rise up. Number five, I love this one. It's a powerful example to unbelievers. We tend to think that if we stand bold by our biblical values, that it's just going to push people away from us. That They're going to be so angry with us. And they may be for a season. But when you stand for God and the anointing of God is moving through you, it is, it's amazing what it does to the unbelievers. King Darius, when he found out that Daniel was thrown into the lion's den, he couldn't sleep. He couldn't eat. He was restless. Ironically, Daniel was in a lion's den, probably at peace and asleep because there was an angel there with him. And it's amazing when you stand for God, the peace that can come over you, even in your hardest circumstance, while those around you are restless. Because conviction, the conviction of the Holy Spirit starts to stir the hearts of men and women. Because the Holy Spirit's moving and he's working. And when you stand for God, don't underestimate the power of the Spirit of God. His loving kindness leads us to repentance. And all we have to do is just make a stand. Just to stand, I will not back down. I draw a line in the sand, and I stand for God, and it may take my job, it may take my life, it may take something precious from me, but the rewards are far greater than the risks. But not only that, God is a redemptive God, and he is redeeming things around us, and when we stand for him, he's bringing redemption. Because what happens the next morning? Darius comes, and he rolls the stone away, and he says, please, Daniel, Tell me that your God is who you say he is and that you are alive. And he responds, oh, king, I am alive. God sent an angel and shut the mouth of the lions because he knows I didn't do anything wrong to him or you, oh, king. And Darius says, we're going to worship this God, the one true living God. And when you stand for God, it brings salvation. It sets people free for generations to generations to generations. And Rick Warren, I got most of this message from Rick Warren, and he says, 18 generations later, in the book of Matthew, when at the nativity scene, I love this, and this is such an interesting thought, is that at the nativity scene, where you had baby Jesus, and you had Mary and Joseph, and you had the animals, and then you had the wise men. And it says, the wise men came from the east. Where was the east? The east was Babylon. And to think that after King Darius declared that we're going to serve the one true God and allowed the prophecies of Daniel and the stories of Daniel to continue to be shared, that these wise men could have heard those prophecies and carried them in their heart through generations upon generations, through family through family, and now they're standing at the feet of Jesus because one man chose to stand up. What an amazing thought. That when you stand for God, that your children and your children's children could could change the world. It's an amazing example to unbelievers. 
And number six, our final point, as the worship team begins to play, you will be rewarded in eternity. You see, Daniel could have gone into that lion's den and just like Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego could have gone into the fiery furnace and they could, have, they could have been burned, he could have been eaten alive. But if we were able to stand in heaven and talk to Daniel, Daniel would say it was still worth it. Why? Why would that be worth it? Don't you feel that God let you down? And he would say no. The reward in heaven is far greater than anything I could ever have on this earth. Jesus says, my father has many mansions and I go and prepare a place for you. That there are crowns and jewels that are going to be given to us in heaven. As he says, well done, thy good and faithful servant. And we get to take those crowns and lay them at the feet of Jesus. And we get to spend eternity together worshiping a loving God. This life is but a vapor. Here one day, gone tomorrow. It's not worth the little bit of time of fear. It's not worth the little bit of pain to give in. It's worth it to stand strong and to trust Jesus because the rewards in eternity are far greater. And listen, when you stand for God, He will stand for you. Romans chapter 8 says, If God be for us, who can be against us? One caveat to that scripture, though, is that to, for God to be for us, we have to be for him. Too often in the Bible, there were times where they disobeyed, there was sin in the camp, and then they started losing battles because God recognized that they were no longer for him. In fact, in the book of Isaiah, it says they honored him with their lips and their heart. They honored him with their, lip, their, with their lips, but their hearts were far from him. If you stand for God, he will stand for you. And nothing can stand against you. What a powerful word. That's the word of God. But the truth is, church, Jesus has already stood for us. He stood for us on the cross. And he stands for us before the Father. In fact, the Bible says that when God sees us, he sees Jesus. He is constantly standing for us. Can we stand for him today? So what I'd love to do with every head bowed and eyes closed maybe you've heard this message today and you don't know Jesus and you think what an amazing God that would stand for me when I stand for him and hold to those values that Jesus Christ came to the earth God becoming man and he went to the cross took our sin and took our shame so that we would be set free and you think, I want to be on God's side. If that's you today, I'd love for you to pray this prayer with me. And if you did pray that prayer, I'd love for you to fill out the Connect card and just say that I've decided to follow Jesus or I would like more information about Jesus. And so with our heads bowed, church, can we pray this together? Dear Jesus, we recognize that we need a Savior. We recognize that we are sinners and that you are God. We thank you, Jesus, that you took our sins on the cross and you died for us. But three days later, you rose from the grave and now we are alive in Christ. We surrender to you. We give you our hearts and make you the Lord of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And for us believers today, while we're standing today, let's stand publicly for the Lord. Because if we can't stand publicly in church, how can we stand in the world? But I want you to look around this room at your brothers and sisters. We're all standing today. We're going to sing this song, I'll Stand with Arms Wide and Heart Abandoned. Let's lift this place in worship and let's lift our hearts so that tomorrow morning when we go to battle, we stand for Jesus Christ, and I promise you, he will stand for you. Come on, let's sing this together.